Well, good evening. I am Celia with the Missoula Public Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. Um, it's I'm always just so grateful that I get to welcome such a lovely, engaged audience that shows up for our programs. Um, probably some for the space, but mostly for these guys. So thank you again for, for joining us. Um, so just in case you wandered up here, you don't know why you're here, what you're here for, where you are, you're in the Missoula Public Library. Um, and tonight's event is a conversation between two knowledgeable and usually never dull, uh, honest examiners of history, authors Peter Stark and Chris Latre. Um, the conversation tonight will be centered around Peter's most recent book, Gallop Toward the Sun, um, but I would be surprised if it didn't venture further afield than that. There will be, uh, we'll start with a bit of a reading and then um, move into the conversation part. They're both enthusiastic about a question and answer component of things, so we will definitely offer that. Um, my request for the Q&A is that if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and my coworker Xavier and myself will bring you a microphone so that we can all hear your question. And also um, MCAT is here recording this evening, so we, they want to be able to hear your question as well for their recording purposes. Um, and then before I introduce our authors, I want to thank MCAT for being here uh, recording tonight's conversation. It will be available on the library's YouTube page shortly um, after this event. And then I also want to thank Fact and Fiction, who are here this evening selling books. Um, you should check books out from the library, but you should also buy them. And you should buy them locally. <laughs> and you should buy them tonight so that Bryn didn't walk down here for no reason carrying books. But yeah. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, and yeah, on to our authors. So Chris Latre, a Métis storyteller and an enrolled member of the Little Shell tribe of Chippewa Indians. His first book, One Sentence Journal, short poems and essays from the world at large, won the 2018 Montana Book Award and the 2019 High Plains Book Award. His second book, a collection of haiku and haibun poetry, descended from a travel-worn satchel, was published in September of 2021. And his next book, Becoming Little Shell, will be released on August 20th, 2024. Chris writes an aptly titled newsletter, The Irritable Métis, and is the Montana Poet Laureate for 2023-2025. <laughs> Peter Stark is an adventure and exploration writer and historian, a longtime correspondent for Outside Magazine. Stark's articles and essays have also appeared in The Smithsonian, The New Yorker, The New York Times, uh, men's Journal, and, and on and on. Uh, his previous book, Astoria, was a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for a Penn USA Literary Award. It was also adapted into a play by Portland Center Stage. His book, Young Washington, How Wilderness and War Forged the Founding Father, was a finalist for the 2019 George Washington Book Prize. And his most recent book is Gallop Toward the Sun, Tecumseh and William Henry Harrison's Struggle for the Destiny of a Nation, or uh, as I've been thinking about it, never trust the guy with three first names. So, <laughs> um, and then, without further ado. <laughs> Okay, oh, you got it. I, I can even hear that, which is <laughs> surprising. Um, yeah, never trust a guy with three first names. We should just call him W.H. Harrison. And then, you know, it'll save the damage that he's going to be receiving in history once they, people start learning about what he, what he was up to. So um, it, it's so great to be here. And thank you, Celia, for the introductions and Missoula Public Library and MCAT and fact and fiction and all of you for coming out on an early January night, which is a, you know, it's an adventure in its own right. So um, thanks to everyone here. And thank you to Chris. And Chris and I are, are old friends and have had many discussions and are very much looking forward to this one. At least I am. <laughs> and so um, I think it should be a fun evening. And so I th what we, we discussed this a little bit ahead of time. 
Um, I'm just going to read, it's just a two and a half pages maybe, from the, the prologue of this book that I'll, it, it, to help set the stage for where, what, what we're talking about here. On a hot Wednesday afternoon in August 1810, Shawnee Chief Tecumseh and his entourage of 40 tribal chiefs swung their birch bark canoes towards the Wabash River's shore. Having paddled for 200 miles among forests and prairies, they stepped with moccasined feet into a panorama of white gentility, the front lawn of the Indiana Territory's finest home, grouse land, fronted by a pillared portico designed in the Virginia plantation style. At this mansion in the wilderness, built by territorial governor William Henry Harrison, Tecumseh and his fellow chiefs intended to discuss treaty disputes. The meeting with Harrison, however, would soon escalate into an angry confrontation over contrary visions for North America's future, two diametrically opposed ways of life. In an atmosphere heavy with symbolism, the fate of much of the continent would be left hanging in the balance. Approaching Grouseland from his canoe, Tecumseh spotted a row of chairs carefully arranged on the grass near the red brick mansion's portico. A new rail fence separated the lawn and chairs from the bank of the smooth flowing river. He hesitated. Watching from the portico, Harrison noticed Tecumseh pause. He dispatched Joseph Barron, his Shawnee-speaking interpreter, to summon the native contingent forward. Tecumseh refused, indicating an open grove of walnut trees along the riverbank about 100 yards from Grouseland's heavy front door. Granting the request, Harrison ordered the chairs and benches moved into the walnut grove. A council fire was kindled to open the conference. Tecumseh's party, their faces painted red, black, and yellow, their heads plucked bald but for a warrior's topknot adorned with feathers, entered the circle, having left their firearms outside by prior agreement, although they still carried tomahawks, knives, and war clubs tucked into their belts. Twelve U.S. soldiers armed with muskets provided the guard for Harrison, Governor Harrison, and the other U.S. officials gathering near the council fire. Knowing from the experience the discomfort of a soldier's uniform in hot weather, Harrison directed the lieutenant in charge to move the troops into the cool shade of a walnut tree. The territory's judges and officers took their seats in the row of chairs serving as a dais. An armchair for Governor Harrison stood at its center. The warriors sat on the ground in a half circle, but, Tecumseh offered, but Harrison offered Tecumseh a chair on the dais alongside the other distinguished guests. It is the wish of the great father, the president of the United States, that you do so, said Governor Harrison, who many years in the future would become that great father himself, the ninth U.S. president. Tecumseh, witnesses reported, stood still. He gazed at the governor briefly. Then he looked up and reached with his arm toward the sky. My father, he said dismissively, the sun is my father, the earth is my mother, and on her bosom I will recline. The effect was electrical, reported witnesses. For some moments, there was perfect silence. Although Tecumseh and Harrison had faced off at a distance during the Battle of Fallen Timbers 16 years earlier, they'd never spoken. Since that conflict, which had opened the land that is now Ohio to white settlers, each man had risen to high command. Now in his early 40s, Tecumseh had merged, emerged as the powerful and persuasive leader of a movement unifying tribes across the continent center, spanning from Lake Superior in the north to the Gulf of Mexico in the south, and from the Appalachians in the east to far out on the Great Plains in the west. Harrison, now in his mid-30s, governed the sprawling Indiana Territory, a quarter, mile, a quarter million square miles of land east of the Mississippi River. Encompassing an area the size of France, it was inhabited primarily by indigenous people. 
Each man single-mindedly strove to defend or impose his radically different vision on the heart of North America. This clash of competing imaginations had reached a pivotal moment. It could tilt towards Harrison's vision, a second wave of America's founding that rolled unstoppably westward by handing out cheap, abundant land to the small farmer, a step toward a truer democracy by giving the little guy the vote, but coming at the expense of Native American tribes. Or it could pivot toward Tecumseh's vision, blossoming into a powerful tribal alliance that Tecumseh and his brother, the prophet, had promised to their thousands of followers across the continent. Holding the land as one, the tribal confederacy would re refuse to cede more territory to the U.S. government. Tecumseh's vision offered the indigenous leadership its last best hope to repel a relentless white onslaught bent on engulfing their ancestral lands and tearing up their ancestral cultures by the roots. Okay, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for that, Peter. Let's give it up for that. I mean, I just, I love that scene of Tecumseh basically dropping an FU on W.H. Harrison, right? <laughs> You know, I mean, and, yeah, totally, and totally. I, I, you know, one of the things Peter and I started talking about this more than a year ago in hopes that our books would kind of come out at the same time. And, you know, mine's coming out a year after yours. Exactly. This, a year. Exactly a year. And, and the, 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 what he's writing about is the exact same thing that happened to my people only, you know, half a century before, you know, and I, and I like to think about, you know, because we. We often look at, at, at American history as like beginning on the East Coast and then moving West. And just like this plow pushing forward and there's all these ignorant savages like, oh, where'd you come from? Right? And it's nothing like that because this isn't that different from the time frame that you're writing about in a story as far as, you know, the ship coming around and hooking up with the folks and the underestimation. Exact same year. Exact, exact same, same year. year that Astoria ship went around Cape Horn was the exact same month, mm -hmm. August 1810, that meeting was taking place. Yeah. And and I think in 1810, you know, my Métis ancestors had already been to St. Louis and back and were breeding cattle on the Northern Plains. Everybody thinks Texas were the ones who brought it to Montana. And we were a couple decades ahead of them when it comes to that. So Tecumseh message to the Texans. Um, and, and, you know, just all of this communication and all this interaction from coast to coast and north to south that was going on. And, and I mean, can you speak to that? Just, just, just the, the perception that we have. I don't think a lot of people even understand that there were meetings like what you write about yeah. in, in the exactly, beginning. Yeah. It, it, there's just so much ignorance about the degree of communication that was happening both between the United States and tribes and among the tribes themselves. Can you speak about that a yeah, little? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I, I, I like to kind of, paint a picture of that when I when I give a talk um, that you know I think especially if you know if you're of European or white heritage and unless you're you know really plugged into the native world it's easy to think in in and it's sort of portrayed that way in history that you know the 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 British and French colonists showed up on this continent and Spanish from the south and you know there were a bunch of like as Chris says you know savages uh, you know, there's a group on around their campfire way up in that patch of the woods and a group around their campfire way in, down in that patch of the woods and one, you know, 500 miles that way, and they never even met each other, which is utterly unlike the way it was. There were, it, it, I compare it to um, the, it, the East, you know, especially because I'm, I'm, that's what this book is about, and, and Chris is more, way more familiar with the tribal geography of the West. But I compare the tribal geography of the eastern United States to, at this time, you know, this is late 1700s, early 1800s, um, and, and before that, think of, think of Europe, Western Europe, and say 1500, and think of how many little principalities and kingdoms and city-states and all these political entities, and they were of course, all in touch with each other, unless they were fighting, and that way they were in touch too. And 
and but there were all these alliances between some of them and some of them were long-term enemies and all that was shifting around all the time i mean over centuries that's just the, the way it was in the eastern united states so there were tribes who were long time you know brothers and there were tribes who were long time enemies and there were i mean there were more tribes long term brothers than long term enemies but there were these these very uh, powerful dynamics and incredibly quick communications that you know they, they were for a long time the tribal communications were way quicker than any white communications um, that that people on you know hundreds of thousands of miles away would hear about what was going on in a whole different part of the continent. That's called the Moccasin Telegraph, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> the Moccasin Telegraph. Well, That's... I call it the Birch Bark Canoe Telegraph, yeah, partly. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and, and not just from the east, but people coming from the west and interacting with tribes, people coming up from the south, you know, from Mexico and interacting, and then, you know, all of the colonization that came in from the north, you know, with the Hudson's Bay Company getting established in the late 1600s and what that all did around the Great Lakes. And, and you talk about the Chippewa a lot, you know, as, as being people involved with, with these communications and these early battles where these first lines of where the settlers can be and where they can't were involved in that, too. And, like, and you know, I'm Chippewa, and my heritage is the High Plains, you know. And, and it's just fascinating to me to think of all of that communication and, you know, even going back to Lewis and Clark, and we have this narrative that the tribes had never seen white people before. Well, if they hadn't, they certainly knew they were coming. That, they, that the award was, was right. running ahead. Well, and, and also, I mean, one of the things now I'm, I'm writing about early, early Spanish explorers and their first contacts and the Puebloan people. And that, it, I, you know, I was, I, I've been really pondering this as I've been writing this first draft. And it's like, these Spanish or the French, or the British, you know, when they show up on this continent, they have no idea where they are. No idea. They have no idea what this continent looks like. I'm writing about the Spanish coming north. It was a complete blankness for them. Mm -hmm. And yet the tribes, they knew the lay of the land over hundreds and thousands of miles and the watersheds. And, and that's just something I really emphasize. Chippewa, they were right at the heart of it all, um, that there were many watersheds linking uh, not many, but many, 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 but linking all parts of North America, essentially. And um, and canoe travel was a huge thing, and that it was very efficient, very quick. You could take large loads, you could take families, and you could travel very quickly. And so that's... Um, that the, I, I love this concept of the, 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 the Native people having... You know, it's like they have the continent imprinted in their brains... And the, the, first, the first European colonists coming here, explorers, like, well, uh, let's go north and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, an assimilation started the other way around first. So, so I write about that in Becoming Little Shell, where when the first traders arrive in what is the, you know, the Red River Colony now, which is Winnipeg, Manitoba, you know, the first few years, the assimilation was them assimilating with us because they couldn't survive. Totally. They didn't know the land, as you describe. They didn't know how to get from point A to point B because they weren't canoe people, you know, and, and, and you know, except for the voyageurs, but they're like a totally different culture uh, in and among themselves, which uh, my first draft had like a wholesale ripoff from Astoria that, you know. Well, feel free. Uh -huh. Go for it. <laughs> Talking about the voyageurs. But but that assimilation happened the other way around where the, the first Europeans had to assimilate assimilate with us and the way we did things because that was the only way they could survive. They had no concept of how to survive the winters and, and the, the seasons when there's no game. So, so it wasn't until, you know, the third or fourth wave that, that you get enough Europeans where that culture can start to change and, and, and force out the existing. And pass down the knowledge within the exactly, Europeans. Exactly. Well. And we, you know, Again, talking about like 1810 was, was about the time that some Métis guys in the Red River Colony were inventing what was called the Red River Cart, which, you know, we talk about the canoe travel and, and, and anthropologists would come and they would say, well, you guys are so primitive, you don't even use the wheel. You know, well, we didn't have to because we had birch bark canoes, which were this 
engineering marvel marvel to this day you know and and we didn't need the wheel until we moved out onto the plains and that's where the red river cart was developed so as we yeah as the buffalo are moving farther and farther west and we have farther and farther to go and we don't have river systems anymore that's when the red river cart that's when the wheel starts getting used on the northern plains when, when it becomes useful basically totally when it becomes absolutely necessary you know then well and and you were just mentioning the voyageurs so and you were saying that that you know the voyageurs were were kind of a different story well they they were the people the the first french who came to the continent in you know the first french settlers in the early 1600s like a year before jamestown i think the french landed their first colony in 1606 and i think jamestown was 1607 the you know the british in virginia but the the french intermixed much more readily with the the native populations of of what's now the east coast of canada than the british did down in in either virginia or or what became massachusetts you know the, the plymouth rock crew um on the mayflower and there there, there was there was sort of like a, a, a uh, steel barrier between whites and 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 indians at that point but in the up in the in Canada, there was much more uh, mixing, and so that the voyageurs, I mean, who are these incredibly tough guys who paddle these canoes, you know, thousands of miles and carry these heavy loads, but they're actually a a um, kind of a, a mix of both the French culture and the Indian culture, and and so they became the the um, you know kind of the messengers and carriers of this great north interior of the continent but it was the 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 indians who had to teach the french they didn't know the first thing about a birch bark canoe when they when they stepped off the boat i want to bring back kind of out of that to something that you mentioned near in, in the thing that you were reading that i thought of um and i hope this isn't one of those questions that because i get asked questions because i say stuff and then they i'm asked to explain it, and it's like well i don't know <laughs> but but the idea of unseated land what does that really mean unseated because that comes up a lot and i think a lot of people are kind of shake their head and they're like i don't know what the fuck he's talking about well either do i really because it means a lot of different things right well it and that's that's part of the, the you know I, I hope we get into this in in sometime in our discussion that the um one of the huge problems i mean maybe the hugest was when the first whites especially the 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 british came to north america on the east coast and they you know started negotiating with indians for it, tribes you know and there were many different tribes and many different agreements for land and then eventually and you know there's a lot of course a long story here the the u the uh united states was born and um it it ended up with a lot of land from the east coast all the way to the mississippi river that was the british gave all that land when the, the Americans won the Revolutionary War, the British had said to the Indians, you know, help us fight the Americans and we'll help save your lands. And then when it, the Americans won the Revolution and the, the uh, Americans and English or British were, were negotiating a treaty, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, the British didn't even mention the Indian lands. The, the Americans said, well, we want the lands all the way to the Mississippi. The British, okay, you can have it. But one of the famous Indian leaders said, the, you know, the British, uh, their Congress just sold out the Indians to, to Britain, which was absolutely true. So the unceded land part comes when, okay, think of uh, from the crest of the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River, huge, huge area, and there are all these tribes living there. And now the United States is saying, well, this is all now part of the United States territory. And so the United States, in its idealism and liberty, in its founding documents, recognizes Indian tribes as individual nations, literally as nations. And they will be dealt with as nations. And yet the United States had to, you know, this is like the framework of the U.S. is this kind of real shaky, I think to call it like 
green raw two by fours tacked together with some spikes. You know, they've just put this thing together and they're figuring it out. And the founding documents say, okay, the tribes are individual nations, yet they are within the United States, which is another nation. So this is where we come to the unceded land part. That that there's all these different legal levels, and they've evolved. They evolved over over the centuries, and there's still to this day. I mean, as Chris can heavily testify, there is so much unclarity about whose rights um, presuppose whose rights and which land rights predominate, and all these things. So. I think technically the best definition is a long answer, but I wanted to get the history in there, the, the, set the scene here. Um, I think technically what I'd say unceded land is in this context, in, in the context of the United States, would be, say, those lands between the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River, which were unsettled by whites or largely unsettled, and which had not been purchased by the early colonists from the tribes, or it, it got way shadier than just purchased. It got, you know, it got outright taken in a lot of cases. But there were legal documents that said this tribe gave these settlers, you know, the Pencil, the Quakers, or whomever, this chunk of land. So that was ceded land. Unceded land would be the lands that were out between the, you know, farther out between the Appalachians and the Mississippi. The tribe still owned. They technically had legal rights to those lands. They were, had not been ceded to the United States. Does that make sense? It does, and, can, and it, but it, it requires a conceptualization of land ownership that was absolutely foreign to how indigenous people exactly. viewed the land. Totally. You know, so we're saying, well, you guys still technically own this in a way that we acknowledge as owned that the tribes didn't. And, and, and it goes west of the Mississippi, too. So, like... You know, the Little Shell, who, who we were part of what was the Pembina Chippewa, that became the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. And there's still 9 million acres of unceded land, technically part of our land base, that I just received a $50 check for a couple months ago as a result of a class action lawsuit from an agreement going back to 1892. Wow. You know, and there's still court cases pending about just this this theft you know and and um again we think of that as as ancient history and yet it is still alive for many I, you know you don't buy a lot of land even in north dakota for 50 bucks i was just glad to be able to buy a buffalo steak at montana club for 48 <laughs> for 48 dollars. that didn't include like the gravy and right, the fries. Right. i had to pay for the for the for the shrimp the coconut shrimp that i got on the, the side sal the small salad well you got you, you got the small salad came with that 50 bucks probably uh, yeah <laughs> exactly and, and but 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 it's not just Harrison. I mean, it's all these guys. That's one of the things I admire, Peter, is that you go after these icons of American history. Those faces on Mount Rushmore, your work kind of amplifies the indigenous people who say, we want to blow those faces off. Because those guys were among the worst people in history for this kind of, this is a word I've only ever seen written. I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it, is it chicanery? Chicanery? Yeah. Yeah, I say, I say chicanery. Chicanery, I, I, yeah, I yeah. And, British, and, maybe chicanery. Who knows? And, and like Jefferson wasn't like giving Harrison direct instructions, but they were certainly between the lines. Yes, and that was one of the you know it, it's it maybe I don't know if it's the key point that I think lies at the heart of this book is that Thomas Jefferson, whom I think you know he's been a hero of mine. And, you know, enlightenment, enlightenment man and, you know, very open to ideas and exploration and very westward looking. In 1803, early 1803, before the Louisiana Purchase went down, Thomas Jefferson wrote a secret letter to William Henry Harrison, who was then about 30 years old, and he was territorial governor of this area, Indiana Territory, the size of France, and that he was... Um, Jefferson, in his letter, said, don't show this one letter to anybody. Hold this close to your breast. Never reveal it. But we need to get as much land as quickly as possible from the Indians. And here's 
the strategy. Get their leading chiefs in as deeply as in debt as you can at the government trading posts. And then once they're in very deep debt, they will have to split off their lands to settle their debt. And so here's, you know, Mr. Enlightenment, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the words, you know, the, to the opening words of the Declaration of Independence, saying, you can uh, just go for it. Get the, get the lands any way you want. And Jefferson ultimately had an, an Indian policy. In, there was no Indian policy. I mean, let's put it that way. In the, that's another fundamental point that I try to make. There was no Indian policy in the early founding decades of the United States. And, and, and that caused a whole lot of problems and still does. And so there was no Indian policy. It was more a policy that occurred on the ground with guys like William Henry Harrison. And under the you know direction of guys who cared in the in the on the East Coast in the federal government like Jefferson, I mean guys like Adams, I don't think really really cared or really knew what was going on out there. But Jefferson's Indian policy, you know, can be summarized in this way: it was either you adapt to white ways and take up white agriculture and sell us your land, and you won't need all this land because you're you're farming now and you're taking up the superior ways of civilization or get out of the way like go east of the uh, west of the mississippi or you can be exterminated and that is essentially that was if there was any thomas jefferson indian policy that is it in a summary mm -hmm. And as a result, like I lived in Ohio for three years, right where you're writing about, I've paddled the, the Miami, the little Miami, oh, cool. you know, and my impression of living there is like there's Indian names everywhere, but there's no Indians. There's no Indians out there, you know, and, and yet it was this, this very advanced culture, millions of people living there, you know, pre-contact, and you would never know, you know, except for maybe some mounds, an interpretive sign here and there, you know, and and it's just such a profound change in a very short amount of time. In a, in a very short amount of time, although I do like to point out that, you know, when talking about the arc of this of this history and, and the native white relations, that from, okay, say the first Brits arrived in, what are we saying, 1607. So between 1607 and, let's say, 1750, 1770, time of the revolution, white settlement essentially went from the East Coast to about the crest of the Appalachian Mountains and may in a little bit over. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how many, that's, uh, that's almost 150 years. And then in the next 50 years, from about 1750 or 1770, it got out towards, uh, until about 1800, actually, when, uh, period I'm writing about, it got out to about the middle of Ohio, and there was a, a famous treaty that drew a line essentially down the center of Ohio called the Greenville Treaty, Greenville Line and Greenville Treaty. Indians on the, on the west, whites on the, on the east, everything settled, you know, got it all done. Well, so that was, that was the Greenville Treaty of 1795. So that's where settlement was ending in 1795. In, um, by 1800, or 1805, Harrison had acquired title to, in various slimy ways, 30 million more acres out towards the Mississippi River. So now we're up to 1800. And from 1800 to 1850, white settlement made it essentially from about the middle of the Midwest and a little bit on the Mississippi River, all the way to the West Coast. So that's, you know, it, it went 50 years to the, not 150 years to the crest of the Appalachians, 50 years kind of down into the Midwest, and then another 50 years, and it was all the way at the West Coast. And it, it just went so fast. And those guys really kind of made the blueprint for how tribes would be dealt with like 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 how Harrison got a lot of that land like with the with the chiefs in debt giving selling him land that wasn't theirs to sell or or identifying people as chiefs to make these land deals who weren't actually chiefs 
and and created all the the differences then within the tribes where now you have tribes saying well you can't he can't do that you know what i mean and that's how they did things then moving west from that point forward that yeah and that was a i mean you 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 hear that phrase playing one tribe against another and you know that's it's not only among tribes it's among empires it's, and among all those little principalities in in europe you know that was it's, it's, it's an ancient age-old technique um but the so the the guys like harrison what what they could do is um they could find certain like almost sub chiefs of one band of a tribe who would agree and you know there were probably i know there were at times bribes involved and whatnot to you know essentially sign a document or get several of these people to sign a document saying okay you can have that you know five million that million acres over there go ahead you know we we, we have title that we'll we'll just write it over to you and the, i mean they didn't the legal system was a complete unknown to them to begin with i mean it was not their their background whatsoever in their background and then um and they were there was just this incredible unscrupulous nature on the part of of federal land agents and and one of the the most famous ones that that kind of really launched a lot of the, launched so much was um in it's called the 1768 treaty of fort stanwix and so Fort Stanwix, I think, is it's in what's now uh, around up, upstate New York, and a British agent there made a, a a treaty with the Iroquois Nation, which is based up there and what's now upstate New York, and and arranged to buy from the Iroquois essentially most of Kentucky, and the Iroquois. Claimed that they they uh, uh, um, predominated that they defeated some of the tribes in that Kentucky area a hundred years earlier. So by that by virtue of that, they could you know sign this document, get ten thousand pounds and a lot of you know arms and gunpowder and whatnot, and the tribes down in in you know seven hundred miles away have been sold out. And the, the British arranged the deal. And so the, then the British can hold up and set white settlers, and it, it happened with the Americans right after that, can hold up this piece of paper and say, hey, here's a treaty. It's signed by a bunch of chiefs. We're going over the Appalachians. Daniel Boone, you go chop that road. And settlers just started flooding in to what's now Kentucky in, in the 1700s, um, right around the time of the, of the Revolutionary War. And once that happened, Things went crazy in once that that dam sort of broke. But that 1768 Treaty of Stanwix, and then there was a, a later Treaty of Fort Stanwix. That was a prime thing that helped open the floodgates. Yeah, and then 1871, the post Civil War, the United States decides they're not going to start recognizing tribes as sovereign nations and stop making treaties. And I like to dramatize, if you don't mind, how this, like, picking chiefs as people that will work with you played out for my little shell people, how we were the landless Indians of Montana for 150 years. So if we go back to the Pemina Chippewa, which we were in this time period, because, you know... Little Shell the first, Little Shell was a hereditary title, so there was actually three of them. And the the, the Little Shell that my tribe is named after was the third. So his grandfather is a contemporary. Wait, 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 he's, he's a chief, Little Shell is a chief yes. of, 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 a, of a particular band. Is that That's the structure. Yep, the Pemina band, that's right. And and you'll see him as Little Clam sometimes. Okay. And, and um, so, so, the, so our chief, Little Shell, is a guy that, you know, nobody's ever heard of, but, you know, my case for him is that the reason he's not as well known as like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and all of these other Plains Indian chiefs is because he doesn't have a body count associated with his name. You know, all of his, because this is post treaty, post sovereign nation stuff with the United States. So he's fighting the United States in the courts and he gets a reservation in 18. 
83, 82, 83, which they then reduced by 90 percent. Where, where's that? Is that this in, is, the, in This the is US? what is the Turtle Mountain Reservation in North Dakota okay. now. And and the the Pembina land was you know from the Red River, which is the border of Minnesota and North Dakota now, all the way up into Lake Winnipeg and ultimately into Hudson's Bay. So the Pembina were from that border all the way to eastern Montana and all the way down into South Dakota. Oh, that's huge. I, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's so, so they get a reservation that's 450,000 acres in 1882, and then two years later, they reduce it by 90% because they say, you don't have enough people living here to justify you having all of this land without recognizing that we were still looking for buffalo. So people would go out and be gone for months at a time. And so they said, well, if, you don't, if you're not here full time as a farmer or whatever, then you're actually not a person here. So Little Shell gets this reservation. And then in 1892, this guy McCumber decides that he wants to buy all this this nine million unseated acres, and he and wants. So that's the and that that was the term at that point. That was the term at that point. It's called. It's got the infamous name of the ten cent treaty, because he wanted to buy all this land for ten cents an acre, which was way way below what anybody else would pay for that kind of land. And he knows Little Shell isn't gonna play ball with him, right? And Little Shell also recognizes that in order to secure this is post a big famine where a couple hundred people died of starvation, you know, and and he knows he has to sell some of it just to establish a place for his people. And but but McCumber knows he's not going to agree to what Little Shell wants. He knows Little Shell isn't going to play ball with him, so he decides, so let's say I'm McCumber and you're my Indian agent. Your name's Wa. And my buddy Bryn back there is Little Shell. So I come to you in 1891, knowing I'm going to be out there the next year. And I say, you need to pick 32 chiefs that will agree to what we're going to pitch to them. So you go out in the community and you tell, get 32 people here to agree to whatever. You say, I will give you 50 bucks and a lifetime supply of ice cream if you participate in what I want to do. And so let's say these front row is our chiefs. And I arrive in 1892, September of 1892 for this negotiation. And Bryn, as Little Shell, comes in with all of his people to negotiate because Little Shell is a recognized hereditary chief of the Pembina Chippewa. He's the guy, as that means to our culture at the time, which... You know, how that's different from what we typically view it is is another thing. But Little Shell walks in and I say, well, you know, according to your Indian agent, you're not a chief. These people are the chiefs. So he's not even allowed to participate in the discussion. So we make our arrangement with these guys. Little Shell bails with all of his people. The agreement gets signed. And that is the point where Little Shell and everybody who follows him become the landless Indians because we get disenrolled. They, we get removed right off the list of who is technically Pembina, Turtle Mountain Chippewa at that time. But we don't stop there. It's because this front row, we start looking around. And we say, you know, we don't like you. We don't like that whole row, whole row back there. Anybody back against the windows, we don't like you. And there's you, 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 and you, we don't like. So we're going to put you on the list, too. And it could be relatives. It could be just about anybody that this group of folks decided they didn't want as part of their community anymore. And they get added also. So that creates this massive diaspora of people who just had their land and their homes and everything jerked out right from from under him and that that follows i bring all that up because that follows kind of the blueprint of what was happening here where where jefferson and harris and these guys would say okay this person will say will agree to what we want to do so we're going to call them a chief and forget about how the tribes have viewed their 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 governance for millennia right yeah, and that's I would just wanted to, to to bring that up while you were describing that. I mean, that was really fascinating live action account of of how this went down with with your people, and 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 this is for, for, I think um, you heard that Chris is coming out with a book in August, um, becoming Little Shell. But this is this 
is all part of the story of that book, which I'm, I'm very eager to read. Uh, um, that, that the le you know, there's this legal system from Europe that was, you know, goes back to Rome. It probably goes back before that. It goes back to the Magna Carta. You know, there's this whole very elaborate kind of abstract concept, which is the legal system that we more or less operate under today. And that my understanding of the tribes in the, the eastern woodland tribes, you know, mostly those east of the Mississippi River, which I've been doing a lot of research in, in that whole in that region for this book, um, was that not always, but in, in many cases, and maybe most, that the, the the leadership was largely by consensus. And yet there were also hereditary chiefs in some cases. But one of the things about the the consensus leadership that I that I write about and, and you know kind of mold over a lot is that that there's no like serious top-down hierarchy if you have a consensus-based leadership that you that you become a leader because people respect you because you are a a, a a powerful warrior because you are wise you you know all these attributes that you have um, um, make people respect you I mean or bring their respect to you I should say and that so that's there, one system of leadership, and then in Europe, you have, under a legal system, too, it's this hierarchical system of, of leadership. There's, you know, a, a governor or a president or, a, uh, you know, whatever the head of a state, and especially in the, in the um, you know, pre, to, uh, you know, back, back in, in, in more royal times, you know, there was a king and a queen and total top-down hierarchy. So... And the military in from Europe was they were extreme top down hierarchies, and so the whole system that came from Europe was extremely um, centrally authoritarian based and it came into a world that was much looser and 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 uh, much more wide ranging in a way both geographically and kind of culturally so can you address that? Well, that's exactly what it was. I mean, Little Shell was a hereditary chief, but it was not my way or the highway. You know, he had to, it was consensus based also. So, so that is very much the same. And, and another thing is, you know, a lot of these tribes were major focal also, you know, where, where the women, they may not be the chief, but they had power. In, in, in the decision-making process that was certainly not part of what the European folks were coming over with either. Yeah, and that's one thing I, I mean I loved about researching this is that um, in the case of the Shawnee, which you know I dove into in every way I could, the Shawnee pre 1830 east of the Mississippi River, all the cultural detail that I could find, but the in uh, among the Shawnee um, and the, the villages or the groups or the bands that there were both village chiefs who were male, and then there were war chiefs who were male. And then there were female chiefs, and the female chiefs had an incredible amount of power, but it wasn't the power that was just like right in your face. It was, I think it was much more right in the face to the chiefs, that the chiefs in a way had to, not in a way, they had to get the blessing of the female chiefs before they were going to do anything. Like if they're going to go to war and the female chiefs say no, it's just not going to work. And so there, there's this real power that they had, and um, it, it, it's a very kind of heartening to read this because you, you know, that you hear these stories. Oh, the Indian women had no status, blah blah blah. It, they were at least the, the, among the Shawnee, very powerful. Uh, yeah, and, and I want as time I mean, we could talk all night, oh, you easily. know, and and. <laughs> Before we get to questions, there's one other thing that I always like to bring up when I'm doing my talk specific to the little shell is how these same policies continue to play out in modern times. But it's just that it's not necessarily just to Indians anymore either. So if we look at, you know, like 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 how get get people into debt and and so we can take their land. I mean, that kind of worked with a small farmer. You know, back in the 70s and 80s when all these farms were, people were going into debt and going bankrupt and then the land ends up in the hands of these big gigantic farming corporations. And we see how 
you know, even in communities all over Montana where, where market value is, is, is almost a tool that drives people who have been here for generations off their land because they can't afford to, to keep it. And we see it in public lands where we have so many folks who are, you know, very pro-America but are also very pro-public land, but the same policies that established America are being used to kind of try and pry that public land away from everybody's use and reserve it for the wealthy and the powerful. So we see these things, and I think that's one of the importance of a book like yours is is it's it's a circle, you know, and it just keeps happening over and over again until you know, we're still the tribes being played against each other to, to, to keep from stopping these things from happening. I mean, do you ever reflect on that as, as far as, as what we're seeing in the 1700s and then the 1850s and the 1890s and the 1970s and now the 2020s? Well, I was just going to ask you that very question. So well, we both have to answer that. I mean, that what, do you, what do you see, you know, what's the future for the tribes. I mean, that's, of course, you know, there are many, many tribes and there are many, many futures. But that, that what, do you, what do you see lying ahead? And what, that, that I feel that they, these issues that we've been talking about um, from the 1700s or 1800s are, yes, are very much alive. I mean, the Supreme Court has just been kicking, uh, kicking some around um, very recently, uh, the Oklahoma case, I think child custody, among other things. And, and there's so many of those issues that go, go way back that, that are alive today. Yet there's also, I mean, I, I feel, I'm not native, but I feel from the outside, there's been this growing sense of native pride and a growing sense of embracing the, the, the culture and both the tribal members themselves, but also gaining more recognition of who they are and who they've been and what, you know, wait, what an important part of this continent they were and are. Mm -hmm. And in a way that they were almost invisible, it feels, for much of the 20th century. And that's beginning to change. Do you feel that? Yeah, I definitely feel there's an upswell of... of of recognition or realization. Like maybe these people who lived here for a few thousand years know a thing or two about how we can like live on this land. And we see that in, in the mistakes we've made when it comes to fire management, we see what, what mistakes have been made to, you know, turning over planes that was, that was, you know, people weren't the dominant life form. The buffalo was, you know, and what turning now all that to agricultural is done to the land and all of these things and and a recognition that maybe there's knowledge here, which we're, which is, we're calling, you know, T-E-K now because everything has to have an acronym. <laughs> uh, t traditional Ecological Knowledge. T wait, T-E-K? T-E-K. Okay. Yep, you, yep. Okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, those kinds of things, yes, absolutely. And, you know, you hear about land back a lot, and what does that mean? And, and there really is a conversation about that happening that, that was unthinkable 20 years ago, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's my impression from, I mean, again, I'm from the outside, but just what I hear and see, and that's, you know, that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I have some quotes about that in this book, but I, let, let's, sure. we, we should go on to the, to the questions. Yeah, should point. we, do we want to open this up for questions now? If anybody has a question, you've got one right here. I'll just hand yeah, you yeah, my yeah. mic since you're right here. Well, I'm fortunate. I grew up in Winnipeg. Oh, wow. Oh. So um, I have a very in-depth understanding of what you're talking about. And one of the things that I want everyone to realize, it isn't until... I think it was 2022 in Canada that the Métis became acknowledged as a tribe. All those members have not received any financial or health care support for hundreds of years. That's how far back it, 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 it continues to be back, you know. So how big were the canoes? That's what I want to ask. <laughs> Well, at least Canada recognizes the Métis because the United States doesn't recognize the Métis as a people at all. And the line I use is that we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And I was just up in Lethbridge this past weekend celebrating New Year's with, with my Métis relatives there, and it was, it was wonderful. So it's going to happen. I'll let you answer the canoe size thing. <laughs> 
Well, it depends on where you're going. <laughs> Well, the the voy I mean, there's one of the. I love this stuff. Um, so don't get me going. The at the height of the fur trade, uh, the the biggest Voyager birch bark canoes were around 40 feet long, and they were paddled by 14 people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, and yeah. I mean, it would be it'd probably be most of that back wall or, or, or more, and and yet those canoes could be carried by. Four and maybe even two guys on a portage. That they were so technologically advanced using the materials. Here we are, T E K, right? Tech. T E K. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And they were so advanced using those materials that were natural, and that that the those canoes could carry. I, I can't remember. It's like five or six tons or something of of supplies or furs. There's nothing. I mean, even today, there's not really anything quite like that. And the just the, one of my favorite TEK details, if I may. I'm <laughs> here for every little one. Okay. Well, and 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 your people, your your people, I'm sure knew these details, know them. But uh, when I was researching my Astoria book, uh, I saw in I, it was in Canada. I thought it was at, a, at the big fort on Lake Superior where they do recreations, and it's, it's still an intact fort from the fur trade. And there was someone making a birch bark canoe, you know, live action demonstration. You know, it takes a long time. And when I got there, what he was doing was he had taken the roots of, I think it's black spruce. So it wasn't just spruce. It was a certain black spruce. Okay, so you, you Winnipeg, you probably know all about these. And they grow in, in, in kind of swamp lands. And they have long skinny, really stringy roots that are extremely tough. And so this guy, the canoe maker, was had these bundles of uh, black spruce roots. You know, they're a little skinny thing, you know, like the clothesline maximum thickness. And he's stripping the bark off them. So he has these white cords that are extremely strong. And so you know how, how many how many centuries could you and I sit out in the woods trying to figure out how to make a birch bark canoe, unless you know without that that knowledge that had been figured out for over over centuries and centuries. My favorite detail, though, and this is from a story, is when those guys up because they want to recruit a bunch of voyageurs, and the voyageurs, you know, we don't care about your money, so they use like the feathers and the fancy clothes, oh, it's like feather. the ostrich feathers, because because the voyageurs were all about style, man, and they didn't care about money. But <laughs> you you upgrade my outfit, and I, I will paddle nine hundred miles. Sign me up for five uh -huh, years. Uh -huh. <laughs> In, any other questions? Yes. Oh, back there. Okay. Um, is there a mic? Okay, you got a mic. Hello. Uh, I spent time out east and as well here, and I noticed, um, you know, in, in, at least in the Appalachian Mountains, um, it's kind of a, 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 you're looked on uh, as kind of venerated if you have Native American roots, especially Cherokee. Here, they're completely disparaged and, and looked down upon. Um, and I've, you know, recently spent some time um, with homeless population and noticed that there's a large population of uh, indigenous people. Um, so my question, I guess, is um, what do you think can break the cycle of eco economic disparage in this, this, this part of the country? And I, 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 I mean, I have one idea that maybe some of the, the money that's generated by the casinos um, on, on the uh, reservations can maybe come into our community here and buy businesses and have some um, indigenous populations move into our own neighborhoods and, you know, just kind of diversify the area. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that and if you have any other ideas of how we can kind of um, intermingle our cultures a little bit better. Do, do you want to start with that? And I'm going to quote you when if... <laughs> no, go ahead. No, but with because I, I was asking Chris about this. We had coffee, I don't know, um, I don't, this fall, I think, and and I, I can't remember what I asked you, but you were emphasizing the importance of education at this certain level and with internships and, and ways to bring natives up through the educational system and keep bringing them up. So, I mean, that's, that's what I remember you saying. And I, 
that I mean, this these questions about you know casinos and revenues are, are they're kind of beyond my ken. Um, I, I think Chris has a better um, grasp of what's going on currently. Yeah, I mean, casinos is one of those fallacies. It's right up there with Indian money, like the idea that all just because you're Indian, you get money from the federal government, and you don't. And there are very few tribes that have casinos, and of the tribes who have casinos, very few of them make the kind of revenue that people hear about. It's only the casinos that are like next to a big white population center where there's enough people to generate all that kind of money. And so, so that that is one of those narratives that that is used against us more than it is used as being as a success story. And yeah, we have these these structural problems that have resulted from everything that you're writing about in this book and everything that has happened over the last 500 years that that we have to work against. And everybody now, whether it's a you know, a conservation group or whatever. And it's like, we want to involve indigenous people. We want people on our boards. We want people doing all these things. It's like, well, if you want that, we need to go back That's and begin with saying, these yeah. education systems and start to rebuild, first provide opportunity. Because there's a lot of young white people in college who were there because of the generational wealth that was generated from land that was taken from indigenous people that never they never saw in the first place. And if we want to start somewhere. Let's put toll gates on 93 and every access point into <laughs> Glacier that. or Yellowstone so that the tribes who don't get a penny from the national parks get some of that. Let's start there and give a few million or a billion dollars a year to the Blackfeet in East Glacier or to the CSKT in, in Pablo. You know, we have to be willing to like actually step up and deliver on some ideas that have meaningful impact. And the tribes, we have a responsibility in that too. There's a lot of lateral violence in, in our tribal communities and it's just a big mess that don't have any easy answers. But it, it's, it's, it's yeah, there's a lot of native houseless people, but there's a lot of veteran houseless people and there's a lot of white houseless people that are people that fell through the cracks because we really don't care about our communities the way we should. Indigenous people never had homeless people. You know, if, if one guy was successful with the hunt, everybody ate. In America, America, if one person is successful at the Costco, you saw those dudes rolling out of there with three carts of toilet paper. I mean, <laughs> Tecumseh would never do that. No, he would not do that. <laughs> no way. He'd be giving it to the elderly people. But that's right. He'd go on these. He was an expert. He was a ma master deer hunter, and yes. he was very fond of of hunting deer. And this would be southern Indiana, and giving the the what he got to the elder people of the village. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's an answer, but is there any other questions? You, Peter brought up uh, a phenomenon that I, I would like to know the roots of. You mentioned how the French integrated much more successfully with Native people than the British did. What is it in the history, in the, the culture, the legal system of French people willing to do that, whereas the English were not willing to do it? I ponder that, and, and I think there are a lot of answers, um, and, you know, I can only speculate. It, one of the th things that's really notable um, is that the, 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 the Catholic Church, I think, had something to do with this, as opposed to the Protestant Church. And, I mean, I think it, it goes deeper than that, but the, the Catholic Church was, uh, you know, very much looking to expand, and it was willing to engage in a lot of different populations where I don't have the sense that the Protestant church was on board with that. I mean, think of that. I mean, think of the, the, you know, the Puritans coming to New England. It was not like they wanted to convert the Indians. Whereas the, the, the um, I'm writing about now for the Franciscan friars in, in, in uh, Mexico and the, what was now the American Southwest. I mean, those guys were serious about converting thousands of souls if they could. And so I think that's one answer. And then I think that, and I, you know, I, I could ponder this for days, but that I think there's something cultural there too about the, the British Isles being very insular and the French being part of the mainland and that they've, they, there were, in a way, there was more, you'd almost say, racial uh, 
diversity in France, I mean, in this kind of weird way, than, than in England, which was very uh, insular in its different parts. So th that's one answer. And I, again, I could ponder this for days. I heard something one time about how French, how France recognized citizens also. So, so like the Métis, my histor historian mentor, Nicholas Ruman, who passed away in 2019, like six months before we got federal recognition. We would not have gotten federal recognition without his work. He talked about this guy, Pierre Lavarandri. Did you ever cross paths with, uh, yeah, with uh, Lavarandri? Yeah, no, I, know, I know who you're talking about. So he, in the early 1700s, is the first person to get into like where the Red River is, like the, in North Dakota. And it was his, two years later, it was two of his sons who were considered the first Europeans to actually see the Rocky Mountain front. And chances are someone else did, but they weren't people writing journals. These are the first guys writing journals to see the Rocky Mountain front. And La Verandere had 40 French soldiers with him. And part of their this mission... This is the dad. This is the dad. Okay. And part of their mission was to get these soldiers out and start marrying into these indigenous families. And Vrooman postulated that that is really the seeds of the Métis people as we know them today, is these French people. And you're right. You know, the voyageurs... You know, starting on the eastern side of, of, of the Great Lakes, they were all Catholics. And they'd stop at St. Anne's Cathedral in Montreal on their way up into the, into the wilds of, of, of what is, you know, Hudson's Bay now. And they would make offerings because she's the patron saint of good weather. And they get and start marrying into these indigenous families. And for close to 100 years, there's this this mix of Catholicism with indigenous spirituality. And that is another thing that we get this idea that missionaries show up and immediately Indians convert. It wasn't that, you know, for the first 50 to 100 years, it's like we recognize that you guys claim this Jesus character has some power. Well, it's a hard freaking life up here. And if we can get something from that guy, we're going to take it along with everything else that we're doing. Yeah, that's exactly And it isn't until the missionaries arrive and start saying, you know, you guys are say you're Catholics, but you're not under the auspices of us telling you what to do, that, that it really starts to accelerate that schism between the, the lived Catholicism of the first hundred years versus the established Catholicism being dictated from Rome. But I, and I think even the the early the early missionaries were much more deft at blending the the native culture with Catholicism, and so they were not very doctrin doctrinaire. Is that what I want to say about their um, you know whether whether the natives were worshiping in in their own ways or blending their ways with with the, some of the Catholic ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a much more openness to that than there was in, in say, the Anglican church or the, you know, the Puritan crowd. Well, and, and the Métis helped spread Catholicism all through, like, Montana because we started taking a priest with us on buffalo hunts. And we would take these Red River cart trains of anywhere from a couple dozen to a few hundred to a thousand out to hunt buffalo, and we always had priests with us. And that allowed them to preach to the people they met, the Salish and the Blackfeet and everybody else, because it's a lot less dangerous when you've got a couple hundred steely-eyed Métis buffalo hunters surrounding you with with rifles than it is when you're out there by yourself. <laughs> and and we certainly were part of that spread of Catholicism. Yeah, it totally, it totally makes sense. More questions? I've got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, is it on? Okay. Um, so you talked about the borders um, and unsucceed, unsuceded land and that kind of thing. Um, I maybe pardon my ignorance, but how how is the Canadian border established? Like you're talking about us moving or being taken over as we moved east. Um, uh, how did I write this down? Um, so unceded. I, I, I can speak to that. <laughs> unceded east coast to the Mississippi, but how or who who established the U.S. Canadian border, and like who had Canada in the 1800s? Go ahead. I mean, you were talking about border. And no, I, I was going to tell Celia, you, you better order some pizzas because we're going to be here a while. <laughs> yeah, you get okay. two yeah. more after two this. Two more one. after this. Okay. No, we're, yeah, we're, we're renegotiating the border while we're up here, right? Okay. Right. <laughs> um, so, that, yeah, it seems really clear now there's that border 
drawn across at, at the 49th, uh, 49th uh, 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 meridian. I'm, uh, is that what I'm saying? Thinking? Parallel. Parallel. Um, and the uh, it, it wasn't always there. I mean, the, the, my book Astoria that came out, you know, some years ago. It was a surprise to me that border didn't exist and it wasn't firmly established until the mid 1840s so until um the mid 18 late 1840s that what's now uh, oregon washington and british columbia including out this way i think at least through the idaho panhandle that was unclear who owned that i mean what nation what, <laughs> The Indian nations owned it, but the, what, what imperial power claimed that? So both British and the U.S. claimed that. And so that, it just is a, ref, the, a reflection of how this was all negotiated over decades or centuries. And, the, you know, you heard that, um, that, that, that uh, phrase, 5440 or fight. That means these were, these were people who were saying, we want the, the U.S. border up to in uh, what's now the Alaskan Panhandle, and, and and in other words, there'd be no British Columbia. That would be all U.S. And the, the same thing happened as you, as you go further east. There's that that you know there was always a lot of debate. Um, the Great Lakes were always kind of more or less a dividing line, not always I should say, because the French once claimed um, all of Canada. And all of what's now the, um, say the Mississippi Valley, was French, and the British only claimed like up to the Rockies. Well, they claimed they liked to. I mean, Virginia when they staked out Virginia, you know, these guys came along and it's like they stuck two flags in the sand, a couple hundred miles apart, on the you know on the Atlantic coast, and they say, well, we own, we claim all the land from here to the island of California, and so, you know. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it really wasn't until the 1870s, at least in the High Plains, that that border was really even being enforced. And that's part of what caused all this conflict with with like my people is is the United States coming in there and and then when after the battle of the Little Bighorn and Sitting Bull goes north into Canada, they were really starting to flex on that border because everybody was afraid the Sitting Bull was going to come down with this army from from Canada of indigenous people and just wipe everybody out. And so all of that border enforcement in the 1870s was just part of everything else that was going on. You know, the, the reservations and the, the elimination of the buffalo and the post-Civil War and all the settlers. There was just so much chaos going on in this part of the world then that, that you know, we just kind of forget about. Another question. Hey, how are you? Well. Um, I want to get back to what you said about intergenerational wealth. To me, what's going on is a need for the process of decolonization. And one of the things that I find it interesting that we rarely talk about is different type of financial ways of helping with that. For instance, no interest loans to be able uh, for, if you have indigenous heritage, to buy land or property. And what I never hear, we hear a lot about conservation land, but we never hear about returning land to indigenous tribal lands. Um, I know of no example of that in Missoula. Um, I'm actually talking to an attorney right now that I will do that with my land when I die. And I want to talk about that and what restitution really means like in this city and this state. Well, I always begin with the overthrow of capitalism. <laughs> Nothing less. <laughs> And, and that's that's that, that's kind of uh, funny, but I'm dead serious. This doesn't work under capitalism, but we do have examples of successful land back. The Bison Range, you know, that was stolen from the Salish a couple times, and and them getting that back, that's a big deal. And there's a there's land in Minnesota that's come back to tribes. There's land that's come back to some of the California tribes, and and those are little lights lighting up on the board of the thing. We we talked about earlier that maybe there's there's a change going but you're right you know we we need to re-envision how we use land and i think more people and ownership of land because as more and more people who thought they were immune to losing their house because of market capitalism 
are starting to realize, well, maybe that is kind of a fucked up system because, you know, I, I call it the battle of whitefish. I was at a reading a couple of years ago where I was reading poetry and, and, and it started with a land acknowledgement that was kind of bad. And then people one after the other going on and on about how much it sucked that people from out of state were moving in and now the locals had to leave. And it's like, Welcome to the last 500 years. Welcome to the United States of America. And that sounds flippant, I, I, yeah, but I'm true. dead serious, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. Who's totally. with me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm very eloquent. Yeah. So one more question? Yeah, and you're going to pick it. Right here? <laughs> okay. To follow up on your statement about capitalism, um, I'm from Alaska, so they have a little different approach in which kind of if you can't beat them, join them. So they established 13 regional corporations and, d and divided it among the native, different native groups. And Alaska actually has 262 tribes, recognized tribes. And like anything, it works okay, not so okay. But I would like your thoughts about how if you've looked at Alaska and how they do that, because we do not have reservations in Alaska. It's only the regional corporations. So for example, the North Slope. Oh, so for example, the um, North Slope people, they, they have, they're really into oil and gas development. And um, the Aleuts on the um, coast fishing. And so um, Cook Inlet Regional Corporation is right in the Anchorage area very wealthy, very successful. Some corporations are not as successful as others. So I was just wondering your familiarity with that system and what you would think about it. We're defining success based on capitalism. Because oil and gas, I don't care if it's Indians or white people, it's a bad way to make money. You know, and, and the reason they don't have reservations is because those tribes weren't treated with pre-1871, or 1871, same as us. Like Little Shell, we don't have a reservation. We didn't get any of those 9 million acres back. We get 200 acres that will be put into trust, but we have to buy it first. So all of the models and, and like, like the people I trust the least on an Indian reservation is the tribal council. Because those governments are, they're following a blueprint that was given to them by the United States. It's a colonial structure. I'm talking even about mine, and I respect my tribal chairman very much, but he is thinking almost entirely economically and ways to make money in a system that's not doing anything but burn the earth up. And, and I, you know, people do what they have to do to survive, and we can't immediately pull the plug on all these things, but, but we have to, we, we did it for thousands of years. We figured out ways to get along with each other and not, like, ruin our, our, our land, and, and that people a lot, I'm good at bitching about stuff, but don't expect any solutions from me. I'll point out all the problems, but but I, you know there are a lot, people a lot smarter than me who I think, if they are given the opportunity to, to speak and 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 develop these processes, I think we can overcome it. It's it's the will to let different ideas actually be put into practice. Oh, that that makes me think of a quote um, that appears in this book in the epilogue, and it's from. Um, uh, Navajo uh, leader or a, or someone who is running for leadership, and who said that you know ninety five percent of the lands in what's now the United States were taken from the tribes. They that that left the tribes with five percent of what they had. But then he said, but five percent is a lot of land, and that. You know, the, the, to change the model to use that that five percent, that those millions and millions and millions of acres, to your advantage, and then it was that was uh, further uh, emphasized by uh, oh what, I'm, I can't remember his name. He's a, a journalist who's who's uh, from Shoshone heritage, but he said, well, you know, um, my people, you know. They, they survived the extinction of the mastodon. 
You know, the last 200 years is nothing compared to the last 10,000. And, you know, they can figure it out. Yeah. So that was a sort of note of hope, this opening, which, which I think Christy speaks so passionately and elo eloquently about. Well, thank you. And I think that's a great place okay. to end it with is what's a thousand years of capitalism and colonialism to people who have been here for 15,000 years. I mean, yeah. And that's, that isn't that the future, right? We're going to write it out. Right. Yeah. And, and figure out ways to write it. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you all for yeah, coming. Thank you. Very, very, yeah. Are you going to sign some books? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, speaking of capitalism, I better okay. run back there.